Starting with TrueNAS Scale 24.10 Electric Eel, the platform moved away from a Kubernetes implementation to a straight Docker implementation. While that simplifies things on the back end, you still need to understand how permissions work and data sets work. While I plan to continue creating tutorial videos on how to set up specific applications, my goal for this video is to give you an understanding of how permissions work, why you want to set a host path for an application, what a host path is, and hopefully get you on track for the fundamentals of understanding how applications interact with the storage system and networking on TrueNAS Scale. And once you understand the fundamentals, you'll be able to set up any application that's on the TrueNASCAL app list. So let's get started. Are you an individual or forward-thinking business seeking expert assistance with network engineering, storage, or virtualization projects? Maybe you're part of an internal IT team that needs to proactively manage, monitor, and secure your technology. We offer comprehensive consulting services tailored to meet your specific requirements. Whether you need fully managed or co-managed IT services, our team is ready to help you. We specialize in supporting businesses that require IT administration or teams seeking an extra layer of support to enhance our operations. Our install team is ready to assist you with all of your structured cabling and Wi-Fi planning needs as well. To learn more about any of our services, head over to lawrencesystems.com, fill out the Hire Us form, and let us start crafting the perfect IT solution for you. If you want to show some extra love for our channel, Check out our swag store with shirts, hats, dust accessories, and more. We also have affiliate links down below that'll get you discounts and deals on products and services we talk about on this channel. With the ad read out of the way, let's get you back to the content that you came here for. Now, something I wanna get out of the way right at the beginning here is no, there is not any official support for VLANs within the application settings of CherNAS scale here at version 24.10. As you can see over here in the networking, I have a VLAN set up and you see the IP address I have set to it. But when you're over here in applications, configuration, settings, you'll notice there's no way to bind to the specific network interfaces that I've defined in networking. Maybe there's a future where they have this planned, but as of right now, there's not an official way to do it. Unofficially, of course, you can monkey with things from the command line, but there's no guarantee that will survive updates. This is an appliance designed to do a specific task. And in the future, hopefully they add that feature, but as of right now, it doesn't exist. Now, before we get into how it works inside of TrueNAS, let's just talk in general how Docker handles storage, because this is an important thing to understand. When you're setting up containers, the application lives in a container, and ideally you're going to be mapping storage to where the settings are for that particular application. So it's not just running the app. Some apps will have a lot of settings or data you may want to put in there or configurations. Those configurations by default by most of the applications that are inside of TrueNAS are going to just store themselves onto the volume that gets auto-created. The problem with the auto-created volume, as opposed to the host path method I'm going to show, is knowing exactly where that data is. You could just back up all of the application data set that is auto-generated when you're setting up a pool and pointing applications there, but that's not necessarily going to be the most ideal way to do this. The better methodology is to use host path where we implicitly say where we want that particular container to store its configuration data. This allows you to rebuild that container and easily back up the configuration of that container. So it's not the container we need to back up. We can always just pull the latest version of that container, but we want to be able to point it back to where that data lives. And of course, then we can use things like CFS replication or whatever backup of your choosing to back up those data sets that we've set in the host path. Because each one of these containers, for security reasons, doesn't get full access to the file system. That's why the permissions come in and are so important because we have to implicitly define what is mapped into that container. And then we have to make sure that the user permissions, which is apps in almost all cases, is set to that particular data set so the container has read-write access to it to write those configuration files. So that's where we're going to start is creating some shares and then showing how those permissions are set. Now this is Electric Yield 24.10.02, latest available here in November of 2024. And we'll go to here credentials and we'll go to users and show that I have a user, Tom, here. You would need at least one user before you start setting up any shares. You can also tie this to Active Directory and not have any users that will work as well. But for simplicity, we're just going to have one user that we'll be using for the share. Go here to the data sets. You see I have this YouTube demo pool. It is the only pool we have. We're going to add a data set, and we're going to call this Test Share. And we're going to set it to SMB, and it's going to automatically create an SMB share. So hit Save. And now we have our test share. If we go down here to permissions, go to edit, you'll see that the built-in users are allowed to modify built-in administrators. And we have, of course, root in here. We're going to add 
the apps permission right now while we're here. What you need to do is add an item who the user is going to be apps. The majority of all the applications I've tested all use this user. So you want the user app, basic, permission modify, and make sure you apply the permissions recursively. So I can continue here and we're going to save that access control list. Now, even though there wasn't anything in here, it's even more important when there are a lot of things in there. For example, an entire structure of data that you've put in there, you'll want to make sure those permissions get added to it in case you want the applications to have access. So now we go back and edit the permissions. It should look like this, where we have the built-in users and of course the user app allowed to modify. This is what's gonna allow applications to talk to something that's in a share. Now, not every application needs to talk to a share, but in this case, we're gonna give an example of one that does. Now, the next thing I do is add a data set for the application we're gonna store. So we'll hit add data set, and I'm gonna add the file browser application, and I'm gonna set this to apps. This will automatically add the apps user to the permissions of this data set. All right, now that we have the data set created, we're gonna go over here to applications, discover, Find the file browser app, install, scroll down, leave the user ID and group ID at default. Not all of them give an option to change this, but it's letting you know when you see 568 that if you went into the credentials users and search for 568, you'll find that is the numerical representation of the user apps. So we'll leave that exactly where it is because that's the permission that it sets by default on there. For the certificate, we're gonna choose the TrueNAS certificate. This way it makes the file browser go to HTTPS. And then this is that automatic volume that was created or will be created if you use it. You don't necessarily know where your data is. It's in the volumes and it's under nested in within the applications. And I want it to be implicit that it's in this host path. So we choose the host path and then we choose the data set we created. So YouTube demo file browser. Then we're going to scroll down further and we're going to add additional storage. This is going to be very app dependent, but the additional storage is a, another host path, which is test share. And then the host path is going to be something that this has permission to access that test share we created. This will give us a web file manager that works well with the same permissions as the users that have access to this share. So we're going to go ahead and hit install, deploying, and now running. Now we can go and take a look at the web UI. The default login is admin and admin, which will give me an error because my password manager realizes that's been used before. Then we have our test share and there's no files in there. So let's go ahead and upload something. And now we have a file in there. If we go ahead and double click, we can play the file. We have permission both to read it, write it, upload, etc. And you can see I have that share mounted here on my system. I can see those same files and I can even if I want to grab a few more things, we'll go ahead and copy, paste them in here. And if we refresh this page, we can see read, write permissions. And once again, if I wanted to view these, delete this particular file, we've got that read, write access back and forth because they both have permissions to work here in this particular share. Now I SSH into the system because I want to show you the permissions of all the files that were created. The 3D pipes that I uploaded via the file browser app, which is owned by apps as the user, has a owner of apps, of course, for the file. The other ones I uploaded via the mounted share as user Tom, so it's owned by Tom. But because the permissions of this particular test share have both app permissions and permissions for the built-in users, which Tom is going to fall under, they can both read, write, and delete all of the files. Yes, from here, you can get much more fancy and start get more granular permissions, but this is enough to at least get you started. I want to show you how this actually plays out in the back end. Now I created another data set called SyncThing Demo, and I went ahead and installed SyncThing. If we look at the SyncThing Demo, it's the same as the file browser. It has the user apps allowed. So this is where we're gonna store our settings for SyncThing. And I've already got the application set up. So if we look here at SyncThing and we go to edit, we can scroll down. And I left all the settings at default, except for pointing it at this particular host path, which is the YouTube demo, same thing demo. Something of note when you're on the applications page as well, you can go here 
and click on the volume mounts. And it tells you that the mount YouTube demo sync thing demo is mounted and it does wrap right here to var sync thing inside the container. This is important because when we're setting up things inside of whatever that application is, we want to know the external versus the internal mount. The external mount is where it points at on TrueNAS. The internal mount is going to be where the container sees that data location. So if we go over here to sync thing, and we look at the Pixel 9 camera and you notice the path on here. If we go to edit, you'll see that var sync thing. Of course, they substitute it by putting a little tilde there because that's essentially what it is mounted as home. But var sync thing slash Pixel 9 camera is where that data is stored. If we were to SSH into the system, we see the slash mount sync thing demo and then we see the Pixel 9 camera on there. So it kind of brings it to where all these settings are and how they map. Now, the important thing I want to point out here is... If we go here to sync thing and we just delete it, we're just going to make it go away. I'm going to delete any IX volumes that may have been created, which weren't any, but it has the box there. And we'll just confirm and purge sync thing. It is now going to be gone. Now let's go ahead and discover the apps again and we'll quench and sync thing. There it is. We're going to go ahead and go through the install. So sync thing's got to be set up again. And we're going to go ahead and choose not this volume, but the host path again point it where it was, which is right there to sync thing demo and hit install. It's going to run through the install really quick here. Now it's back up and running. Open up the web UI. Completely configured with the settings and it's already now engaged with the other system. So all the configuration, the data, everything is stored just in that particular data set. Now, all the settings I've covered thus far in the video are just for the TrueNAS apps that come with the TrueNAS ecosystem. There are two more apps in that ecosystem that are particularly interesting, which is Dockage and Portainer. What makes them interesting is they themselves are Docker management tools. So you can load those and then load more Docker images on there or even more custom Docker. I think this is really interesting and that'll be a future video because, well, I haven't finished all the testing and making sure I understand the nuance of having a Docker container manager that you load through a Docker container management tool. So there may be some trickiness to it. That'll be a separate video. To watch that video, like and subscribe to the channel to be notified when that comes out. Check out my playlist down below for all the different TrueNAS videos I have. If you want to have a more in-depth discussion about this and other topics, head over to forums lawrencesystems.com or just over to lawrencesystems.com where you can find other ways to connect with me through social media or my newsletter. All right, and thanks.